Hello and welcome to all of you joining us at the Happiness Festival hosted by the Happiness Institute at Oxford in association with Going Light and Oxford University Scientific Society. Today uh, we are talking with Professor Laurie Santos, Professor of Psychology and Head of Sun College at Yale University and creator of the internationally popular online course, The Science of Wellbeing. Uh, welcome, Professor Santos. It's an absolute honor to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, uh, so before we start, uh, towards the end, we will have a live Q&A session. Uh, so you can start posting your questions uh, on either of our Facebook or YouTube live stream channel, and we'll pick it up from there. So um, now I'll hand it over to Raymond Ho, uh, who is our final year undergraduate student in experimental psychology and doing research about well-being at Oxford. So he's going to do an in interview with uh, Laurie. Thanks so much, Ivanshu, and thank you so much, Laurie, for joining us. Um, so I thought, I thought it might be nice to start the discussion by talking a bit about your own experience in the field. I know that you have a background in comparative cognition, and that um, I understand that as investigating the evolutionary basis of the human mind by comparing human and non-human cognition. How did you transit from that to well-being? Yeah, well, I, I joke that the comparative cognition work is still my day job, you know, and we, I still have an active lab of students who are studying that stuff. But um, yeah, the transition to well-being happened in a new role that I took on at Yale, where I became one of their heads of college. Um, so Yale, like Oxford, is one of these strange schools like, you know, at Hogwarts, I think that's how we have to explain it to people who are outside the kind of Oxford bubble, right, where they're these kind of colleges within a college. Um, so I became head of college, which means I live on campus with students. Um, and it was in that capacity that I really started to see student life up close and personal. Um, I didn't really know how many students were depressed and anxious, you know, how overwhelmed they felt all the time, you know, how many were having panic attacks or even suicidal ideation. It was kind of a shock to me when I first took on the role. But I quickly learned that, that wasn't just, you know, something strange about Yale. You know, this is something that we're facing in colleges in the U.S. nationally and in college-age folks around the world. Um, you know, young people are just much more depressed and anxious than they've ever been. And so that kind of got me thinking, like, you know, I wasn't meeting my educational mission as a faculty member. I wasn't really meeting my kind of like support mission as a head of college. And I just wanted to see like, well, what can we do about this? And so that was what really drew me to the work in positive psychology. I'd been involved in a few programs with Marty Seligman's group and his positive neuroscience initiative, but I hadn't really thought about like, you know, thinking about applying this in my own daily life. Um, and to kind of help my students. And so because I'm a nerdy faculty member, the quickest way I could kind of take initiative was to teach a class on this stuff, right? Like I could develop a new class where I taught students about all these concepts. And I thought I would try to create a class that had both the kind of scientific side, so students were really learning about these findings in positive psychology, but also the applied side, right? I mean, the problem, as you probably well know, I mean, like being a person who practices this stuff, that it's easy to know this content, but it's harder to put it into practice, right? And so I really wanted to help my students do that. And so it was this kind of interesting smush of a class where we had both the science side and the practice side. Um, it was a totally new class at Yale though, and at Yale students don't pre-register. So I had no idea how many students were gonna take a class. Um, but uh, so I figured it would be like, you know, 30 or 40, which is sort of typical for a Yale psychology class. Um, I was shocked when over a thousand students uh, tried to enroll in the class. Um, it was just under one out of every four students were trying to get in. Um, and we ended up having to teach the class in a concert hall. So that was my kind of strange introduction to the work on well-being. But I think it really taught me that, you know, a lot of people need this stuff, not just on campus, but even really beyond. So it's caused me to take a, a huge switch in the content that I'm most excited about. You know, I still do the work on comparative cognition. My lab is still running, but a lot of my focus is on kind of sharing what the science of positive psychology has to say about how to live a better life um, and trying to help people, especially in these kind of scary times we find ourselves in right now. So one thing that um, a lot of us taking your course will realize that um, there are certain misconceptions and happiness. And I was wondering if you could run us through some of them and see how surprised um, our audience will get if they don't know about it already. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the most jarring things when I first got into this work was recognizing how much we get wrong. Um, and I think that's really important to think about, right? Like, it's not like we don't have any idea about what makes us happy. Like a lot of us have really strong hypotheses about what we should do to make things better. But the research usually suggests that a lot of those hypotheses are wrong. 
Um, so one of the biggest ones is that, you know, happiness is not built in, in the way we really think, right? I think we can look out at people and knowing what we know about genetics, just assume some people are kind of built to be happy and others are not, right? And the research does suggest that well-being is in fact heritable, but it's not like 100% heritable, right? It's not like that you can't make a change in it. And so I think that's one of the first misconceptions that's important to kind of deal with. Like you can do some work and fix these things. Um, the second misconception that I think is really powerful is that uh, we often think that well-being comes from our circumstances. You know, if we become super rich and like, you know, hit the lottery or, you know, we get into the perfect school or we get the perfect job or we get the perfect partner. Like we think that those are the things that make for happiness. And of course, circumstances matter, especially if you're in really dire circumstances, right? Like if you're financially unable to put food on the table or put a roof over your head, yes, getting more money will help. Or if you're in a traumatic, you know, abusive situation, obviously you need to get out of that. But, you know, for most of the circumstances that I bet the people who are listening to this find themselves in, changing them won't really help. You know, financially speaking, you know, right now, uh, at least according to a 2009 study, if you're earning over about 75,000 US dollars, say, um, you probably won't get any more happy if you double or triple that salary, um, which is not what we think, but it's really what the data suggests. Um, and we sometimes think new material possessions will make us happy. It turns out there's a correlation between materialism and happiness, but it's a negative correlation. So as you get more materialistic, as you kind of seek out more material goods, on average, your happiness goes down and not up. And uh, you know, for our uni students who are listening out there, you know, we often think those uni students often think like, you know, perfect grades are you know the way to happiness, right? Like I need to like ace all my classes and things. But the data really suggests that that's also not the case. There's also the data suggests a correlation between grades and happiness, but it too is a negative correlation. So students who on average get the best grades are actually the least happy. And so all these things I think are really important, right? Because you know, if you were to have most of my students tick off on a list what they needed in life to be happy, it would be like you know, money, the perfect relationship, the perfect grades. And the data suggests that, again, for most people, that's not gonna make the difference we think. So evolutionary speaking, you would think that if we know what is going to make us happy and we go do it, that's probably going to be the most beneficial for us. Then why are we so misled by the brain and chasing what makes what we think makes us happy, but actually doesn't? Yeah, I think this is the million dollar question. I think there are kind of two answers to this. So one is like, it's not really natural selection's job to make us happy. It's natural selection's job to help us like survive so our genes can get and reproduce so our genes can get into the next generation. And so it's not like trying to like make life okay. It's just trying to like avoid us kind of getting eaten by a tiger or like avoid the negative things, right? And that's why, you know, I think, and that contributes a lot to unhappiness, right? We have a negativity bias. We tend to pay attention to the things that are bad. It's hard to focus on things that are grateful, even though that will make us kind of feel better. And so part of it is I think that that's not natural selection's job necessarily. So it makes sense that it hasn't prioritized accuracy on that. Um, in some ways, the inaccuracies might be really good for survival, right? Like kind of over-prioritizing the negative stuff, you know, kind of constantly striving for more money, more better relationships and stuff. It might not be a recipe for happiness, but it might be a recipe for more resources, which is what natural selection cares about. Um, the, the second way to answer that question is that, you know, there's a lot about our minds that's just not like optimized super well. You know, there are a lot of kind of glitches of the way it works. And I think one of the ones that comes from neuroscience is this really interesting disconnect between the processes of our brain that control kind of wanting, like the behaviors we do to seek stuff out, craving and that sort of thing, and the processes in our brain that uh, control liking, like the actual pleasurable experience we get from something. And there's interesting data suggesting that wanting and liking circuits are kind of dissociated in these interesting ways. And so we see that most prominently in the context of addiction, right? So if you're addicted to heroin, you have incredible wanting for the drug, like this enormous craving, you'll do anything to get it. But in practice, once you actually get the drug, it doesn't actually feel that good. You don't really even like it that much, mostly because you're habituated to it in the context of drug addiction. But it shows that these things dissociate. And I think that's really powerful. It means there's stuff we're seeking out, like say, more accolades at work or perfect grades and these kinds of things. Like we have motivational systems that are like, go get those, go get those. But then when you get them, it kind of doesn't work the way you think. And the disconnect between these systems mean rather than update and learn and be like, wait a minute, I didn't like that. Like, let's update the wanting here, people. What often happens is we realize like, oh, we didn't get what we thought. We, we probably need that even more. 
you know, like, I don't know, like, you know, like, like $1 million didn't make me happy. I must need, you know, $10 million or $100 million to be happier. You know, perfect grades didn't make me happy right now. You know, the A minus didn't make me happy. I must need the A plus, you know, in the U.S. kind of grade system or the four, four star, is that what you guys have? No, um, you know, like the, uh, you need the perfect, perfect grades to be happier, right? And I think this is the, this is the challenge is that because these systems aren't lined up correctly, um, you, you kind of get these disconnects where we're working really hard and satisfying and doing the stuff that our brain tells us, but our brain is kind of not telling us the accurate information. So what actually makes us happy then? Yeah, well, it's not what we think. And, 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 and it's worth kind of reminding listeners where we get the data from what makes us happy, right? Like, um, you know, it's not basically what researchers do is they go find happy people, you know, they find the happy people, you can find them, they're out there in, at Oxford in the UK, here in the US too, right? You find the happy people. And then first you kind of do a little bit of ethnography and survey them, right? Like, like anecdotally, what's making these folks happy? And you get surveys of how happy people spend their time. And then what researchers do is they say, okay, that's what we think is happening. That's what's true kind of in terms of people's self-reports. But now let's force people to engage in certain practices. So now you intervene, causally pick ha unhappy people and sort of have them do the stuff that happy people do. And then you see if happiness improves. So it's both this kind of correlational approach of like happy people tend to do X, Y, and Z. And then it's an experimental approach where you say, okay, let's make the not so happy people do X, Y, and Z and see if their happiness improves. Um, with research like that, we've now learned a few things that really do make us happy. So one is the sort of taking time for social connection. Um, every correlational study I know of happy people suggests that happy people are more social. They spend time with friends and family members. They talk more to strangers. Like they just engage socially generally. Um, but again, that's not causal explanation, right? We need to do an experiment where we force people to be more social. And that's just what lots of folks from Liz Dunn and others have done. They've um, kind of made folks interact more socially, uh, sometimes even with strangers. Uh, and what they find is that that makes us happier on average, that our positivity increases the more social that we are. And so that's kind of a big one, you know, we need to be more social. Um, another tip that we get is that we need to be more other oriented. Um, sometimes we think happiness is about self care, like treat yourself is a mantra that everyone in the US talks about right now. Um, but the data really suggests that happy people don't do that. Happy people take time to be other oriented. They give more to charity. They spend their time volunteering. Um, they're kind of constantly thinking about making others happy and treating other people rather than themselves. And there's experimental evidence that if you force people to do more nice stuff for others, their happiness will improve too. Um, the third thing that we don't realize makes us happy but is really quite powerful um, is gratitude. Um, this very pro-social emotion that can cause us to want to do nice stuff for other people but experiencing it in and of itself, kind of taking time to count your blessings, the research suggests, can really make you much happier. It can also kind of reduce one of the factors that make us not really enjoy the kind of nice things in life we have, which is the sort of phenomenon of hedonic adaptation that we might not talk about later maybe, but it's, it, gratitude really lets us savor the things that we do have. So we notice them and can be a little bit present and appreciate them a little bit more. Um, a final thing I'll mention, there's lots of other ones which we can maybe get into, but a final one I'll mention is that happy people tend to be present. Um, happy people tend to be in the present moment. Um, there's lots of research now, both in psychology and in neuroscience, about the power of mindfulness, you know, the power of kind of non-judgmentally just sort of being there for the present moment. And the research really suggests that reducing your mind wandering, sort of reducing the extent to which you're not mindful can really improve well-being over time. It also has a host of other benefits too, like it makes you better at self-regulation, it makes you better at kind of committing to the hard things you need to do in life, it makes concentration a little bit easier. So it has a host of benefits, including that it actually makes you happier. So those are just some kind of ones that, you know, and, and, and just to point out with all of these, none of these are cases where at least I personally get a craving for this stuff. You know, I don't like necessarily crave, like I wanna be mindful right now, like I crave, you know, a cupcake or like my students talk about craving good grades, right? But yet the data suggests that they really work for making people happier. So in, in a sense, is it more a tool than of something you do to actually enjoy? Yeah, I mean, I, you mean the, which thing, the tool specifically about the, you cut out there for a second, sorry. Oh, sorry. So um, in a sense, is it a tool that we have to use to just make us happy? Or is it, is it just a thing that people do in order to be happy? Or is it something that we 
uh, get addicted to like grades or like yeah, I mean, I think I think the the circuits that respond to these things that we think are going to make us happy, but don't make us as happy as we think. I think they all have a particular component, which is like they're kind of easier to learn. You know, your grade is a thing you get, or like money is like a thing you get, or you know, like they they kind of have this feature almost like a drug where it happens, um, and you kind of notice it, and it's sort of and and I think they have these features that you know if you look at how we learn about drugs and how the reward pathway works it's kind of this circuit that's a reward is tied to kind of learning over time. Um, but the sort of pleasure we get from like being present or the pleasure we get from kind of noticing and feeling grateful, it kind of, it doesn't work like, you know, eating a cupcake or had it getting like a hit of cocaine. It's kind of like this like broader, chiller kind of happiness. But it turns out that those are the kinds of things that really make for a good life and make for a flourishing life, but they don't necessarily activate the reward system in the same way. And so that's why I think things like this class and learning about the science of this stuff and the kind of festival that you all are putting together is so important. We need to really understand what the science is telling us because our minds and our reward circuits aren't necessarily doing the learning for us. We kind of have to learn in a different way to put these things into our lives if we want to feel better. So in terms of driving change, I know there's something called requirements in your course. Um, would you mind telling us a bit what that is and how that could lead to us to thinking better and having a happier life? Yeah, well, rewirements was like my dorky professor kind of word instead of course requirements. You know, every like college class has course requirements, like a midterm and, you know, final paper or that kind of thing. I wanted to add in what I called course rewirements, which was practices that we know will improve students' happiness if they do them. So things like, you know, making a new social connection, taking time for gratitude, meditating and becoming present, taking a moment to scribble down what you're grateful for, or expressing your gratitude to others. I didn't want students to just learn, oh, there's cool scientific studies that say these things will help. I wanted students to do them, you know, and for nerdy Yale students, the best way you get students to do them is to like put it in the syllabus, you know. I couldn't make students do it for a grade based on Yale rules, but I could list all these requirements there. And the, the data really suggests that if you kind of take time to intervene on these things, you will feel better. And uh, a, a kind of dumb thing about being so blindsided by how many students were in the class was that I didn't, with my scientist hat, get to kind of take pre and post data about you know, whether these things made students feel better. Anecdotally, I got tons of reports that students felt better. Um, but now we're doing similar work kind of doing pre and post measures on our Coursera learners, the online version of the class that I teach. Um, and what we're finding is that the requirements are really helping um, on a standard measure of happiness that Seligman's group came up with, which is called PERMA. It's like a kind of one to 10 happiness scale. Um, people are going up about a whole point, which is really impressive. And, and it, I think it's not just learning about these concepts, but really actually doing these requirements over time. So this is one of those asking for a friend questions. Um, there's a popular concept lately called nudging. And I was wondering if you could explain what that is and whether you could nudge people who's been procrastinating from doing requirements in your course. Yeah, yeah. So nud nudging is um, a, a concept that I think was coined by uh, folks like Cass Sunstein um, and Dick Thaler. Uh, where rather than kind of forcing people to do stuff, you know, kind of like, you know, regulating them or kind of making sure you kind of like, you know, like forcibly make them do stuff. Um, you kind of just make the situation a little easier for people to do stuff, right? Um, and so this is often talked about in terms of healthy eating. You know, if you just, you know, put the healthy stuff in the lunch line in a more obvious spot, you know, put the apples up front and center, people are just gonna naturally be more likely to take them. Not because you force them, you said, no, you have to eat apple. It's just like, it's a little bit easier. And that's kind of how I thought about the requirements in the class. I thought, I don't want, you know, you have to do them for the grade, but I'll kind of put a reminder in and, you know, like remind you of what it's there and kind of put a date near it. And so it kind of just like helps you do the thing. It kind of gives you a situation that makes it a little bit easier. And that was kind of generally the approach that we took with students, you know, as we gave them data on what would really help them, you know, we didn't force them to do it, but we tried to set up situations that made it a little bit easier for them to engage with processes that, you know, they might say themselves would be useful for their improving their own well-being. One thing that's constantly on our mind lately is the recent pandemic and it's been affecting us one way or another. Do you think in some ways COVID has changed how we view happiness? Yeah, I think I think there's a I mean there's I think COVID has changed a lot of how we view a lot of stuff in society, including our own well-being. I think um, COVID has 
first of all, caused us to realize that there was a lot of joy in our life that we were taking for granted. You know, I know myself that, you know, weeks before COVID, I would, you know, walk into my favorite coffee shop and get a coffee and sit there with my laptop, you know, no mask, no fear that I was going to catch a horrible disease. And now I realize that that was like an incredible privilege, an incredible blessing that was really fragile, right? Like I didn't experience the joy of that then that I know I would experience now if I got that. Um, just the idea that, you know, our elderly relatives and our family members are just going to be safe and healthy, right? That we could, you know, drive to their house and give them a hug, you know, like if we wanted to, you know, those are all things that we took for granted that I think we won't take for granted as much if and when we get back to them, right? And I think we will get back to those things in time and hopefully we'll experience them with a lot more gratitude than we did before. I think another thing that COVID is teaching us is that it's possible to switch around our schedule and our priorities. You know, before you might've said, well, I, you know, I just can't have social connection because I just don't have time. I just don't have time at work or I don't have time to be with my family. And, and COVID's taught us like, none of these things are guaranteed either, right? Like a lot of us can work from home. You know, a lot of us can change the priorities that we have about work and what counts as connection. And I think that's been really powerful. Um, and finally, I think COVID's really taught us that, you know, there's a lot that we, you know, need to kind of be grateful for in a different way, just things like our health and our lives and so on. Um, you know, I think COVID has put into perspective how much stuff is really fragile. And I think it's caused us to appreciate those things differently and to want to kind of like do more stuff with that. Um, one of the reason I bring this third possibility up is that there's a lot of you know, discussion about what's called post-traumatic stress, obviously, which is a real thing and a, a you know, real issue for the folks that face it. But there's also lots of data on what's called post-traumatic growth. This idea that going through a trauma, especially a collective trauma, can build up people's sense of meaning. It can often promote new social connections. It can make people feel more resilient than, than, when, than before the trauma. Now, it's not that if you ask people who've gone through trauma, would you want to go through that again? People are not like, yeah, it was super awesome. Trauma is like, awesome, let me do it. But people will often still say that more good than bad came out of it, or that they're really thankful that they went through that because now they've learned so much. And I think that that's the third thing I think COVID is really going to change about how we think about happiness. I think on the other side of this, we're going to think more meaningfully. We're going to ask questions about what can lead to a better society. I think this is already happening in the context of the kind of anti-Black racism that's being called out in a different way right now. You know, the legacy of that stuff was there for a long time, but I think people have some time on their hands and can kind of face it and, and are thinking about ways to change society in a way that they might not have before COVID. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of ways it's changing our thoughts about happiness, but I think there's a lot of reason to think that on the other side of this crisis, we're really potentially going to have, you know, happier communities and maybe even happier societies than we did before. So in some ways, do you think it's sort of encouraging, encouraging us to actually seek for what a good life is and to seek for happiness and to actually look for it because there was a crisis and now we've learned how to appreciate what we've had before? Yeah, in some ways, I think, and it, there's a few features of that. I think one is, you know, a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us are facing situations where we have more time on our hands than we had before, right? Like a lot of people are getting this very strange time windfall, whether that's you're not working anymore, or you're working in a different way, or even that you're saving time from your commute, right? Because you're kind of just home in a different way. Like a lot of us have some time on our hands and that causes us to ask the question, okay, like, what do I really like in life? You know, like, I mean, if you're, like, it's cliche in the US right now, but on social media, everyone's like baking bread or making banana bread or like doing these like projects, right? And I think part of that's that people realize like, I actually like baking bread. I actually like savoring this feeling of what it is, you know, to have this good food around or to create these kinds of things. People just didn't have time to do the stuff they liked before, right? Um, I think a second feature is that, you know, one of the biases we know about the human mind is that we don't think about time and situations continuously. We have these kind of breaks in life, you know? So if you turn 30, right, that's a big break, you know, before when you're in your 20s and now your 30s. If you move to a new city or move somewhere for grad school, it's like, that's this new moment in your life that you see as a break. And work by Katie Milkman and her colleagues shows that we really can think about those new weird situations and moments as a fresh start. It helps us like say, okay, you know, that was before me, that was pre-COVID me. Now I'm gonna engage in these new kinds of habits. So oddly enough, it's a moment where we can like break from what we did before and kind of start something new, which I think is quite powerful. Um, the third thing, and I think maybe even most powerful, and particularly in the context of thinking about 
the sorts of protests that are happening and conversations about ending racism and so on, I think what happens in the context of crisis is that people are really motivated to help others. You know, we have this stereotype that in, in like a crisis situation, people are gonna hoard toilet paper and, you know, like be really mean to their fellow man. But the data really suggests just the opposite. When bad things happen, people's urge is to reach out and help others. And so I think we're at this moment where those urges are really being applied to you know, long legacies of struggles that folks have faced for a really long time that people are engaged with it in a different way, in part because they have some time on their hands, but in part because they really have this urge to kind of help others. And I think this crisis is causing some of the injustices we face in society from you know, essential workers, like being of a different status than white collar folks who can work from their home, the kind of systemic injustices that lead some people to be more devastated by this disease than others, right? I think these things are coming to the fore and people have the energy and the motivation to kind of jump in and deal with them in a way that seems, you know, really different than before the crisis. So if you had the chance to redesign your course to fit with the current situation, regardless of pandemic or protest, would anything be different? Yeah, well, I think, you know, people often say, you know, is, is the way, is the path to happiness different now? And I think, no, the same things are kind of there. Um, I think what I might emphasize more, and this is true in part because of the conversations that are happening now and COVID, but, but also just in general is I think, you know, sometimes the class can get misconstrued as stating that happiness is really this individual thing, right? Your life circumstances don't matter. Here are the requirements, just do them and you'll be happier. Um, I think that misses something, which is that, that, you know, there are structures in place that make this harder. You know, we know countries that face injustice and that have unequal income distributions are more happy than ones that are a little bit fairer, right? Um, I think it is the case that we, by solving some of these structural inequities could really promote happiness. But I also think that the path of becoming happier yourself and becoming more gr grateful yourself, you kind of building up this resilience, that alone can give people the bandwidth to try to jump in and solve some of these structural changes, right? And so I think if I was redesigning the class, I would kind of talk about the interaction between these individual practices and these structures a little bit more carefully um, and make it clear that I really do think that one of the benefits of these kinds of things, of these practices that allow you to become happier yourself, is that it can give people the bandwidth to like fight and change these big structures that we know are not great for happiness generally or well-being generally, and bigger things like you know fairness and justice and all this other stuff too. We're of course very thankful and grateful for you to de uh, develop this entire course and teaching us how to be uh, happier with ourselves the correct way. How much of the well-being research do you actually apply in your real life? And is there a particular theory or concept that has the largest impact on you? Yeah, no, I apply it to myself a ton. Um, as I admit in my Coursera class, I wasn't, I'm not like genetically the most happy person. Like a lot of these kinds of techniques don't come naturally to me. Um, I'm more of a like gripey, kind of morose, you know, see the dark side of things person by nature. So it's kind of odd that I've become this sort of strange happiness guru, especially given my old work was not on this topic. Um, but I think that, you know, that honesty helps people, right? You know, one of the things we teach about in the class is that this stuff works, but you kind of have to do it, right? And, and our minds are not intuitively telling us to do it. They're not causing us to crave things like gratitude and social connection in the same way. Um, but, you know, being the person who teaches this stuff, I've had to practice what I preach or it's like embarrassing. You know, if you're teaching a thousand kids like to be grateful and they hear you griping in the dining hall, they're going to be like, mm, like Professor Santos, like you're not doing it, right? And so what that means is that I've had to adopt a lot of these policies and, and so many of them have helped me. I think I'm much more social than I used to. I'm much more actively grateful and kind of and pay attention to my blessings than I used to. Um, things like meditation and even exercise, another healthy practice we didn't talk about. Those are really transformed. I can feel them making a difference in my day you know, when I'm kind of engaging with those practices even more kind of like uniformly or even more um, throughout my daily life. Um, and so it's really what I feel like is that teaching the class hasn't necessarily made me like a perfectly happy person, but it's definitely made me happier. My own PERMA scores have gone up between like one to two points, depending on when I measure it. Um, but more it's given me tools that when I feel like things are going bad, I'm like, okay, I know the things I need to do. I just need to do them, right? And I feel like I wasn't armed with that knowledge before. So the knowledge doesn't make it immediately the case that you put this stuff into practice, but it really does give you the tools you need when times are tough to know what you could do to make things better. 
And so for the last few questions, uh, we can move on to more hypothetical realms. If you were stranded on a desert island for 30 days with sufficient food and water, and your only source of entertainment to sustain yourself was a scientific paper, what paper would that be? A single scientific paper, you think? Yeah, that, that was the answer. Yeah. yeah, I think, so then, I mean, there's lots of considerations here. You want like an important one, but you also kind of just like want like a really long one, like so you can <laughs> come back and stuff. Um, this kind of gets away from my positive psychology work, but I think I would pick uh, Premack and Woodruff's uh, paper about theory of mind, which is a very famous paper in brain and behavioral sciences from 1978. And that includes lots of different commentaries. And so that's something I study in my academic life as a primate researcher, but it also is kind of really interesting and important philosophically and stuff like that. Um, that's what I'm picking mostly because it's like a super long one and I feel like it would just give me something more to do. <laughs> And the last question we ask um, all those speakers on the Happiness Festival. Let's say you have all the funding in the world to investigate one topic and you can do whatever you want with the money. There's no restrictions, absolutely. Um, what would that be? That's a really hard one. Um, I mean, honestly, what I'd want to do with the money is like kind of do what I'm trying to do with a lot of this kind of happiness popularizing that I'm doing, which is kind of to try to pass the mic to all the people who are doing the excellent work. So I think if I had all the money, what I'd want to do is set up a consortium of other researchers who I could give the money to who would be doing the cool work. Um, but if I had to pick myself one topic, you know, the one I'm feeling most strongly recently, and I think this just has to do with recent events that are going on, is, you know, what we can do to help well-intentioned people who feel like they're not biased, help fight bias. Um, you know, I see a lot of the racism and a lot of the problems that face society, not that there are people who are just like, yay, injustice, I love it, or like, I'm super bigoted and I'm proud of that. I think everybody feels like they're being a good person, but somehow they're not kind of doing the right stuff. And so the research project would be kind of investigating how do we get good people to engage with more progressive ideals? Um, and what can we do to kind of get allies to be better allies? Um, this is a topic that we're, I'm currently working on two podcast episodes about, and I'm realizing that there's there's great science on this, um, but I still feel like, you know, if I'm trying to get allies to be better allies, I'm not totally sure what to do. And so that's a puzzle that I'm thinking about a lot, at least this week. If I had the money, I'm definitely going to fund all of it into that. Thank you. <laughs> Someday I hope you will, Raymond. Thank you. Um, so I think now might be a good time to open up a uh, question to the floor. Uh, to do that, I'll hand it back to uh, Dimitri. Yeah, thank you very much, Raymond, and thanks a lot, sorry, for answering all his questions so comprehensively. Um, so we collected a few questions from our live feed, and I'm just going to ask you one by one. So uh, we have a question from Joanna Shirakubuki. So you can ask, like, hello. And nice to meet you. How can we encourage ourselves to move on after a very bad grade? Students seem to feel like they have failed when they take a bad grade and they lose all motivation to study more for the following exams. Yeah, I think this is a big one. I mean, I see this firsthand in my Yale students about how much kind of we put on grades and so on. Um, one thing is to recognize that there are data that show that often the fear of the bad grade is less bad itself than the actual bad grade once you get it. Um, there's lovely evidence about the failures of what scientists call affective forecasting, which is how we predict we're gonna feel after a good and bad event. You know, So I'm constantly making predictions when I'm studying, like how am I gonna feel if I get a super bad grade or how am I gonna feel if I get a good grade? And what the data really suggests is that both of those kinds of predictions are off. You know, we, we think that our life would be so much happier you know, if we got that perfect grade, but actually in practice, if you study people who get perfect grades, what you find is that they like, you know, quickly move on. You know, you get the A and you're like, all right, now I'm gonna move on to something else I'm really anxious about, right? So the happiness boost that you think you would have gotten with this better grade isn't kind of there, right? The same is true about negative grades. I think again, you know, I see completely that negative grades can feel really devastating, but they're often not as bad as we predict. And we get, we get better at reacting to them over time sooner than we think. And this is true, not just for grades, you know, if you're like listening to this and you're not in school, like, you know, that's true for breakups. You know, we predict that if we were to break up with our partner, we'd be devastated forever, but actually in practice, we heal much more quickly and it's much less devastating than we think. And so I think this can be a powerful way to kind of 
answer this sort of grading question, but answer lots of questions, which is that the data suggests our mind is more resilient to the bad stuff than we think. Like awful stuff can happen to us and it's not gonna be as bad nor as bad for as long as we think. So I think this can kind of be quite powerful to just remember you're more resilient than you often think. I think the second way to answer this question is that you know so many of us right now in the context of COVID, but I think just in general, need to learn better skills of self-compassion. Um, so compassion is this wonderful emotion that kind of causes you to kind of feel for people in your life, but also to be really active about wanting to help them. Um, and, you know, compassion is important. The research suggests to extend to other people, kind of engaging in compassion can, can help us resist burnout. It's one of the techniques when I'm called upon to talk to first responders right now that I talk about a lot is sort of engaging in practices that promote compassion. But I think when I see my university students, I think that kind of compassion they need most is not compassion for other people, it's like compassion for themselves, right? Like we are constantly beating ourselves up about not, we in academia, I think in general, are constantly beating ourselves up about not being perfect, not doing enough. And that constant beating ourselves up is not great for our mental health, but it's also bad for our performance, right? Like, you know, if you're kind of not having a growth mindset about your performance and you're constantly beating yourself up, it makes you do worse, right? And it makes it less fun while you're doing worse. And so I think techniques to engage in some self-compassion about your performance can be quite powerful. And one of the most robust ones I know about is a practice of meditation known as loving kindness meditation where what you do in the context of the meditation is rather than pay attention to your breath, you actually pay attention to a feeling of compassion. You try to extend that broadly. You know, so you pick somebody that you like super love in life, somebody that's really easy to extend compassion to. Oftentimes people actually pick a pet because they're so kind of unambiguously lovable. And you sit there and you experience what it feels like to wish that pet or that person May you be happy, may you be safe, you know, may you feel loved, right? And then you kind of go through people in your life that are harder and harder to give compassion to. And at some point in that process, you devote it to yourself. So you sit there and you incubate on, may I feel happy, may I be safe. And the process of doing this means it becomes harder to beat yourself up, right? You know, you realize like you did the best you could on that exam, like, you know, you're gonna try harder, like beating yourself up isn't gonna help, you know, and it's just kind of not right to do. And so if you're kind of feeling really stressed about your own grades and you're in the category of beating yourself up all the time, try a little self-compassion and some practices that experience self-compassion. Not only will it kind of help you feel better in these awkward situations, but it'll give you the emotional resilience that you need to help others. And the data suggests it helps you burn out a little less. Thank you. Um, I hope that answered your query, Joanna. So the next question is by Osin Murat from Oxford. So he asked, um, this may sound rather philosophical, uh, but I want to ask anyway, uh, would we be aware of happiness if there was no sadness? Mm, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think, you know, what happiness is, is kind of a big puzzle, right? I mean, part, part and parcel of this philosophical question is, you know, does happiness require sadness? Can you be happy if you're also sad? Like, kind of what does happiness really mean? And I kind of being a nerdy psychologist often use the nerdy psychology definition of happiness, which is I often think of happiness as being happy in your life and being happy with your life. So being happy in your life means that you experience lots of positive emotions, right? You feel joy, you feel laughter, you feel, all, you know, like, like, like satisfaction and savoring and all these things. Um, it, it does mean experiencing less negative emotion, just like opportunity cost, right? Like the more you're experiencing negative emotion is the less kind of joy. It doesn't mean no sadness, right? But it just means that you at least have some of the positive stuff. Um, at the same time, there's the being happy with your life, right? And that's a real kind of question about your own satisfaction with your life, right? Like do you, you're, all things considered, are you satisfied? Do you find meaning in life? And I think sometimes the answer to that latter question can involve a lot of sadness, right? You know, if you talk to the activists who are working really hard right now to make, you know, huge changes in social justice movements, they might be experiencing a lot of sadness. But I think the answer to that second question, are you satisfied with your life? Are you getting meaning? That can often be um, incredibly powerful. Like people can say, I'm completely satisfied with my life. Some of the people who endure the most negative emotion are actually the most satisfied with their lives. And so I think that, you know, the basically the answer to the philosophical question is like, yes, we can know what happiness is in the context of sadness, because sometimes having a little bit of negative emotion can be important for true flourishing, true satisfaction with your life. Thank you. Um, so next question is by Brian Kempler. 
so uh, how much of happiness or how easily a person can be happy is it in your genes? Uh, that is how much happiness is programmed uh, versus how much is due to your environment. Yeah, and this in some ways is worth noting that this is like an impossible question because epigenetics, you know, I know some of the folks who are helping out this call are like, you know, scientists who study genetics and stuff and like, there's a lot of interactions between with the genes and the environments, whatever. So with that caveat aside, researchers tried to answer this by looking at whether or not well-being levels are heritable, right? And often the way we look at heritability is to look at, you know, how similar is the well-being between folks who are genetically identical, so say identical twins, versus ones who have very, very similar environments, but don't have the same genes. So say fraternal twins, right? You know, so they were in the same womb, they probably grew up the same way and so on. And when you do that, what you find is that the evidence suggests that well-being is actually heritable, but not as much as you think, right? Like, just like, you know, like my height is heritable, but if I eat completely differently, you know, it might not be the same height as my, my parents or something like that. Happiness is what folks are saying on average, they're different creates, but it's around like 40%-ish heritable. What does that mean? That means I think, or the main takeaway from that, I think, is that we have a lot of control over our happiness. There's a lot we can intervene on it, you know, much more so than my adult height or my eye color. Like my happiness is not as determined by my genes, right? Um, I think the key though, is that it's also not determined by a lot of what we think, right? It's determined by our mindsets and our behaviors. And that's great news because I can't really control my genes. Honestly, can't control a lot of my circumstances, you know, maybe some, but that's like a lot of work and some are always going to be out of my control. But my own behaviors and my own mindsets for the most part are usually going to be in my control. And that's super good news because it means we can intervene on our own happiness levels. Thank you. Um... Again, a question by Brianna. So uh, could we engineer happier people using biotechnology? I'm not talking about genetically modified babies, uh, rather helping adults using small molecules, psychedelics, gene therapy, et cetera, uh, to live better lives. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's some interesting possibilities here. I often get the question about psychedelics and happiness. And I think you know, of areas of research that are super exciting. I think this is one of them. Um, I think we don't have all the answers in yet, but they're getting some exciting hints that these kinds of chemicals, which have been culturally used in, you know, lots of different domains to have, you know, experiences of flourishing and so on, um, they might be doing more for our happiness than we expect, um, just in terms of the physiology of kind of the kinds of experiences we have, but also how we engage in some of these practices that make us happier. You know, there's some lovely work by Molly Crockett and her colleagues showing that, you know, psychedelic experiences of the kind that people have at festivals, like at say Burning Man, allow people to feel more naturally social connect, socially connected. They allow people to feel more meaning, but through this kind of feeling of not being alone, of people feeling all as one and so on. And so I think there's some exciting potential there. I think the jury is still out, you know, we just need some more research. Um, but I think that kind of research is happening at some of the best labs in the world. And so I think 10 years from now, that's going to be a really exciting new frontier of this connection between kind of happiness and psychedelics. Um, we don't know a lot yet, but I think what we're learning is kind of exciting that there might be some avenues for interventions with this stuff. The question is like, can we do the same thing non-chemically just through our behaviors, through things like meditation and really connecting with people and so on. And so I think, again, those avenues of kind of figuring out how all that works are gonna be really exciting in the years to come. Um, then we have a question by uh, Greg Kerr, who he asks, uh, your four key tips would resonate with theists or regular church goers. Is there a correlation between theist and happiness? Yeah, so there's a correlation, a very strong correlation between um, religious practices and happiness. It's actually not as much a correlation with religious belief per se, but it's about religious practices. So do you go to services? Do you engage in religious activities? Um, people who engage with religious activities self-report being happier than those that say that they don't. And I think the reason is kind of exactly what this question implies, which is that people, when they engage in religious practices are often doing the stuff I just said matters for social connect, matters for happiness, right? They're engaging socially, they're giving more to charity, they're taking time to be present through things like prayer and so on. They're engaging in grace and gratitude, right? Um, uh, even other th things we haven't talked about, they're you know, often taking time off you know, to, to engage with things like the Sabbath and so on. Um, their religions are one of several cultural institutions that over time have kind of put into place things that we know make us happier. 
And therefore it's no surprise that people who engage with those practices are happier themselves. Um, the interesting thing is that it's not about beliefs per se. It's not about whether you say that you're a theist or not. It's really about your behaviors. And that means that, you know, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, you can find other secular ways to engage in these behaviors um, that can make you just as happy perhaps as religious practitioners. Um, thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Isabel. Uh, so do these rewiring techniques uh, work with individuals who have mental illness such as depression? Yeah, I'm glad that Isabel brought this question up because I think it's a really important one because um, these things do work to improve happiness and they can work for people who self-report being depressed or anxious. But I wanna be clear on like what scale of mental health illness we're, or mental illness we're talking about, right? Um, and the analogy I often use with my students is, you know, if you were to go to a cardiologist for your physical health symptoms and you walked into the doctor's office and you said, doctor, I have high blood pressure, your doctor might say, well, you need to start exercising. You'll get on the treadmill, you know, for an hour a day and get your body moving, right? But if you walk into a cardiologist and you say, doctor, I'm in acute cardiac arrest, I'm having a heart attack, he wouldn't say, well, now you should get on the treadmill and like run a couple miles because, you know, you need to like be exercising, right? Like the, the remedy for that acute situation would be really different. And I think that is critical to realize in the context of mental illness. You know, if you're feeling a little depressed and a little overwhelmed and out of it or just kind of anxious and just like not yourself, then engaging in these kind of activities that I'm talking about, all these rewirements would be incredibly powerful for boosting your flourishing. And there's work by Sonia Lubomirsky and others suggesting that these things can serve as interventions in the context of anxiety and depression and so on. But if you are acutely suicidal, you know, if you're in the middle of a panic attack right now, I'm not gonna say, you know, write down a list of like five things that you're grateful for, right? Like you need a different kind of acute care. And so I think that these things have their place even for people who are kind of below baseline of flourishing or, but again, they might not be the best immediate remedy for really acute mental health situations, which is really important. I think in those cases, you often really need urgent and immediate psychiatric care. Um, then we have Joel from India uh, asking how to avoid negative thoughts and boost positive thoughts amidst like bad situations. Yeah, this is a hard one, Noel. So thank you. I mean, I think we uh, one thing to realize, I guess, first is that practices like meditation um, and practices where you try to become a little bit more mindful can help you realize that you're not necessarily your thoughts. And I think this is one of the things that pr practitioners of meditation self-report is like the negative thought can be there and it doesn't necessarily have to be true, right? Like you can challenge it and kind of fight with it, right? Just as in kind of other types of therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy and so on. But beyond that, I think practices like meditation can cause you to realize that it's okay to be with negative thoughts, right? Again, we're gonna have some sadness in our life. We're gonna have some uncertainty. We're gonna have bad situations. Um, the thing that's bad about them isn't necessarily the situation themselves, it's our reaction to it, right? This is an incredibly Buddhist notion that, you know, it's, it's partly our, it's not that we feel anxious or we feel uncertain, it's like our freaking out that we're feeling that way. That's really the problem. Um, and so one of my favorite parables about this comes from the, the, the Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist religion. Um, it's the, what's called the parable of the second arrow. Um, and so in the story, Buddha is talking to his followers and he says, you know, if you're walking down the street and you get hit with an arrow, is that bad? And people will say, yeah, you know, that sucks to get hit with an arrow when you're walking down the street. And so Buddha will say, well, what would happen if you got hit with a second arrow on top of the first? And people would say, well, that's, you know, much worse. Like it's, you know, even suckier to get hit with a second arrow. And so Buddha goes on to explain the first arrow we can't control. You know, those are the bad things in life. You know, the, the things about which we're thinking negative thoughts, right? But Buddha would say that the second arrow is under your control. That's your reaction to it, right? You know, so I could get sad. You know, there's a lot to be sad about in the world. There's a lot to be angry about in the world. There's a lot of negative things right now, right? But then I get to control my reaction to them. You know, so I get to control whether I experience the fear of COVID and like freak out and are like mad at my husband and like don't do any work and then don't exercise this week because I don't feel like it because everything's so sad. Like those, all other things are on me, right? And by choosing a little bit better, by controlling your reaction to those negative events, 
um, kind of recognizing thoughts as thoughts and that you have some control over them, you can kind of take some agency back and that can be really powerful. And so that's a, a, a parable that I use a lot in my life right now, especially in the context of COVID and just like in general for personal things. Um, I have a friend who, uh, you know, if I'm kind of complaining about something or he's watching me go down this path of sort of stabbing myself with a second arrow, he'll text me like two little arrow emojis. And that reminds me of like, oh, yes, I do have control over this. That is my own reaction to it. And I, again, it's not easy, but you can kind of work on that. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, so Chris Johnson asked, um, how do you know whether, you're have, whether you have gratitude because you are happy or happy because you have gratitude? Yeah, well, this is like what a lot of scientists have to struggle with, right? Which is this, you know, kind of just data wise, right? This correlation versus causation issue, right? Um, and we have it for all kinds of things for gratitude. Like we see grateful people are happier, but is that because you know, grateful people, happiness makes you, or sorry, gratitude makes you happier? Or is that because like when you're happy, you just notice all these blessings around in your life? And so the way researchers deal with this is to do interventions. Like they bring in not so happy people and they force them to like experience gratitude. They just train them like, just write down three to five things you're grateful for. I know you're not a grateful person by nature, but there's gotta be something that's a blessing in your life. Think about it, actively choose to reorient your attention to the stuff that's good. And what you find is that when people do that, they then become happy. So now instead of just a correlation, we get some causal arrow, right? Like forcing yourself to be the kind of person who's a little bit more grateful, like forcing yourself to experience those positive grateful emotions actually makes you happier. Thank you. So one last question from the audience. Um, so Hamza Mahmoud uh, asks, uh, what is the relationship between the academic study of positive psychology and therapy? Yeah, I think that there's um, lots of relation and that the kinds of things that they're suggesting are really connected, right? So the act of kind of taking time to be more grateful and sort of reframing your thoughts and kind of focusing on different things kind of looks a lot like a lot of the ways of kind of rethinking your thoughts that's done in the context of CBT and DBT and so on. Um, I think that there historically hasn't been as much of a connection, which is kind of unfortunate because everybody's sort of in the same game of making people happier, but also using a lot of the same techniques. And I, I'm excited to see now that practitioners of positive psychology generally are making more connections to the mental health community. I think in two ways, one is like really testing whether these techniques work in the trenches with folks who are going through an acute mental health crisis. Um, again, not super acute, like, you know, immediate suicidal ideation, you need something else other than the gratitude journal. We're really trying to see if these kinds of things improve depression, improve symptoms of anxiety and so on. But I also think folks are kind of realizing that a lot of the ancient techniques that folks have talked about um, really do kind of map onto current, current day modern positive psychology interventions that are really empirically based. And so I think there hasn't been as much of a connection historically, but nowadays there's more and more of it. And I think that can be really exciting as we try to marry some of the interventions that positive psychologists have used and make sure they work, they still work in some of our most vulnerable populations. All right, thank you. Um, I think that was the last question we had. Um, so on that note, uh, both Raymond and I would like to thank you so much, Laurie, for joining us today and sharing uh, with us your perspectives on happiness and well-being, uh, particularly in such unprecedented times like these. Um, I'll encourage you all to tune in to and sign up to Laurie's amazing post podcast, The Happiness Lab, and her life-changing online course, The Science of Wellbeing. It's free, um, it's bound to make you happy, and hopefully you'll learn more about living the good life. Um, we hope you enjoyed the, this live stream event as much as we did. If you want to hear more talks and interviews with field leading scientists, please like, subscribe, or follow our Oxford University Scientific Society social media channels and also our collaborators going live. Uh, if you'd like to revisit this talk, an edited version will be released as a part of the Happiness Festival later in July, uh, and we'll keep you updated. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.